Thanks for coming out early in the morning. I'm the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative, an international NGO working to mobilise capital for climate change solutions, including green cities. I want to talk a little bit about the challenge, about some of the issues going forward, and what's happening around green bonds, including in Malmo, to help finance the kinds of cities that we need to live in in the future. Thank you very much. The the thing you need to know about this initially is that the reason I'm here, this is a fast-growing, dedicated specialist market of fixed income investments, financing green solutions of one sort or another. Sweden is the largest per capita issuer of green bonds in the world. Some 14% of all bonds, I think, last year were green. With cities being a big feature of that. Gothenburg, Malmo, Stockholm and so on have all issued green bonds here. But it's not just Sweden, it's also the US, it's across Europe, it's China, it's India, it's Brazil. There's about 440 billion US dollars of green bonds outstanding in the world today, half a trillion roughly. We expect that to grow to a trillion dollars a year of issuance within two to three years. We hope it'll be sooner because we need to get there sooner if we're to make an appreciable impact on climate change. How many of you have had a chance to look at the recent International Panel on Climate Change report a couple of weeks ago? Hey, that's a pretty good turnout. So you'll be aware of what's going on. Essentially on current trajectories of climate change, we are heading directly to, if you've seen the Lord of the Rings, Mordor. We have a world of extraordinary heat in the next 100 years of minor things like sea level rise as an increased storm activity, of major things like epidemics, war, and so on. At this stage, the climate scientists I speak to say that if we are to, if we see the changes that we expect on current trajectories, and it's very important to note that we have been tracking at the worst possible trajectory of the International Panel on Climate Change's expectations for the last 25 years, and we have not deviated off that yet. We are still in the worst possible trajectory. So the IPCC report is a discussion about what we need to do. It's a long way from what we are actually doing. Emissions need to be dropping 10% per annum globally. They went up again last year for 25 years in a row. In fact, the last 25 years, emissions on average, have gone up faster than the previous 150 years. So while we've had a lot of Kyoto Protocol meetings, we actually haven't made much progress globally, even though we have in individual pockets around the world, like Sweden, where emissions, in fact, have been reasonably well managed. Still not as low as they could be, but done, uh, one of the best in the world. Unfortunately, emissions are still growing in the US, are still growing in China, despite strong state action in the last couple of years still growing in India, and, and so on. So, so just to be clear about this, uh, the climate scientists I speak to talk about losing a third to two-thirds of the world's population by the end of the century, based on current trajectories. That's because if you look at something like the Syrian war, which Obama, President Obama called a climate change war a couple of years ago, um, you're going to expect to see that across large parts of the planet. The way that war worked was that in 2006, 2008, there were significant heat incidences right across the Syrian agricultural zone. About one and a half million people moved off the land in Syria into the cities, mainly poor Sunnis, fundamentalists to a certain degree. But um, they couldn't get work in the cities, and the government didn't do anything to help them. Uh, in 2010, we had another incidence of extreme heat over a whole summer across the Russian steppes, and the Russian wheat crop failed. Russia banned exports for a whole year. Russia's one of the world's major exporters of wheat. That meant that the wheat price, the spot price of wheat, went way up through the roof, um, quadrupled. In a number of countries, no hedging about wheat prices happened. So therefore, prices did actually go up in those countries. You can guess which countries they are. Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Syria. And that was the Arab Spring. Now, you may know those students of history that before the French Revolution, 
in the 1700s, wheat prices quadrupled the year before because in that case, severe cold meant famine in the countryside for a couple of years before. There's a rather direct correlation between quadrupling of wheat and revolutions around the world. So we can expect to have these kinds of heat instances and impact on agricultural production on a regular basis because we're heading into a world of extreme weather volatility being the norm. It doesn't mean always heat. We will, in Sweden, some, in some winters, have extremely cold winters, and then that summer we'll have three months of 30 degree heat. That's what it's going to be like. It's going to be up and down, up and down. We will have extreme rainfall changes. Won't be little rain. I mean, even in Boston now, which has rain similar to Malmo, they're actually widening the stormwater drains because Boston's going to become monsoonal. So that you're going to get huge dumps of rain and then droughts. Washington, D.C. is doing the same thing. So weather is changing right now. We're going through the in initial impacts of climate change. And it's worth noting that the way greenhouse gases work in the atmosphere, there's a latency period. So what we're feeling now is the greenhouse gases that were put in the atmosphere 35 or 40 years ago. Now, I mentioned to you that emissions have gone up since then. You can expect that even if we were to stop greenhouse gas emission tomorrow morning, cold, we're going to have another 35, 40 years of increasingly bad weather until things start to stabilise. That's roughly what happens. Of course, there are specific challenges called feedback loops. And in a separate paper issued after the IPCC paper came out, uh, there was a discussion of the key feedback loops and what happened. The most important feedback loop, which is essentially an environmental burst of activity that means that we have it, make it, it makes it very difficult to then control the world's climate. Uh, the worst of those is the leaking of methane from underneath the Arctic seas. Um, you will find out about it more than anyone because you've got researchers in the Arctic. Uh, we have already had a Danish research vessel come back a couple of years ago from the uh, Russian Arctic, reporting kilometre-wide plumes of methane gas bubbling up from underneath the ocean. So these are old tropical forests, frozen under the ice bed, under the uh, continental shelf, which have been frozen for hundreds of millions of years. And as the Arctic warms up, because we lose summer ice in particular, then they warm up and they release a lot of methane gas. So this is a bit like the earth farting. The trouble is, greenhouse gases are very potent when it comes to the effect on the atmosphere, and when those gases, if those gases, but probably at the moment when, those gases start coming out in volume, that is more than one kilometre wide plumes of methane, <coughs> it will become pretty impossible to do anything to stop climate change. We get what's called runaway climate change. And at that point, we just go straight to four to six degrees average Celsius warming, 10 degrees Celsius warming average over land, about 20 degrees Celsius warming on average in the Arctic. So you can expect forest fires in northern Sweden to be the norm by then, if you've got any forests left. So that's what we're looking at now, just to be clear. When we talk about action on climate change, we are talking about trying to avert catastrophe. We're not talking about trying to gently ease into a different kind of environment. We're not talking about trying to slowly but surely change the planet so it's more livable. We are talking about drastic and rapid action commensurate with the kind of the challenge. And those feedback loops, like the, what they call the clathrates, the frozen methane under the Arctic Ocean, are beginning to leak. And the IPCC report said maximum 10 years, maybe 12 years, to be able to address that. Christiana Figueres, the ex head of the United Nations uh, Climate Change Commission, says five years maximum. So these are the time frames we're looking at. This is a bit scary. I have to say. It also means, by the way, that you young people, unfortunately, can't do much. You've got to go and start preparing for whatever world us elders leave to you. So you're going to have to start thinking about how we survive as a species in a world of increased volatility. There will be increased volatility, come what may. The only question is just how severe that volatility is. My generation, our generation, is the first generation in human history that has both understood exactly what we're doing to the planet and the last generation that has a chance to fix it. It's a, a, a rather strange responsibility, I'm going to say. So that's the background. Not particularly good.
the reason why there is scope for hope and the reason why the IPCC report says we potentially have 10 to 12 years to act still maximum is because we do have a fairly clear idea of what has to be done. It's not exactly rocket science. We don't need research and development here. We know what the solutions are. We just simply have to enact them. And some of them are quite profitable, investable. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that about 80% of what we have to do on the planet to achieve a rapid reduction of emissions and start preparing for a world of increased volatility that we're going to have anyway is investable, can be made with private capital. This is very important because what we have to do at the moment to achieve a transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy is going to require some 90 to 100 trillion dollars of investment by 2050. Now, let me put that in a context for you. The US annual GDP is about 17 trillion dollars US. The amount of investment we're going to make in emerging markets and infrastructure in the next 12 years is around 60 to 80 trillion dollars. The current valuation of infrastructure on the planet total, including the vast amounts China's built in the last 20 years, is 50 trillion dollars US. So just think about those figures. 17 trillion dollars a whole US economy per annum. 50 trillion total valuation of infrastructure on the planet. 80 to 9, 80, 60 to 80 trillion going to be invested in the next 12 years anyway. A lot of it in coal plants, unfortunately, at the moment. And we've got to invest something like 90 trillion overall in the transition to 2050. This is a lot of capital. I mean, if we are able to invest that capital, well, one of the things we know, sort of economics 101, is that investments in infrastructure tends to improve growth and wealth in societies. We are about to go on a 30-year binge of investing in infrastructure and switching our infrastructure over. This is not building empty apartments in Las Vegas, which is what we were doing in 2006 and 2008. This is building productive infrastructure and making decisions about the kind of infrastructure that we're going to build. But it is vast. Now, the kinds of infrastructure that we know we've got to build, fairly straightforward. We know about clean energy. According to the IPCC report, coal has to start disappearing within 10 years. In Western countries, gone by 2035. That's a really difficult news for Poland to digest. We are currently pushing the European Union to bring coal into the green bonds universe, would you believe? So, but that's but just to be clear, that is now very much the absolute objective. Coal gone totally by 2035 in Western countries, by 2040 in emerging markets. Every single coal plant that we build now is a stranded asset, is a dead duck. Because coal plants typically have a 40 year life. So anything we build around the world, and we are building something like a thousand coal fired power plants around the world this year, every one of those has to be closed down halfway through their life at max. That's what we have to do. That means we are going to be bailing people out. Somehow or other, we're going to have to manufacture a fund, or by regulation, which goes to the new coal plants in Indonesia and say, guys, we're now buying you out and closing you down. That's something we're going to be doing in the next 20 years. And it'll take a few severe weather incidents and we'll get political will around us. Unfortunately, it's not certain we'll get it done in time. Gas has a longer life. Gas can last to about 2050, but only to about 2050. We do not have a long lifetime of gas. It is not an 80-year transition fuel, if you see the Chevron ads in some magazines. We actually need to start looking at how to phase out. So Nord Stream is not actually a great idea because we're investing long, creating long-term infrastructure for a kind of fuel that if we are to have any kind of future for our children, must go in that time frame. In clean energy, we've got to build renewables in vast scale. That includes hydro, by the way. It means a lot of hydro around the world, which is challenging for some of my friends who are trying to save rivers everywhere. But I say to them, we aren't going to have any rivers the way we're going. We're not going to have any people to actually enjoy those rivers. So we have to dramatically scale up, even when we are now, clean energy. That includes nuclear. It's low carbon. I hate it. I think it's stupid. But I'd rather live next to a nuclear plant than a coal plant right now. So that's my own opinion about, it, about nuclear. 
Not as in New Sweden, you've got lots of nuclear. In France, you've got lots of nuclear. In China, there's lots of nuclear. We've got to run it properly. We need to keep it going as long as possible. Germany has made a terrible mistake in the last 10 years of closing down nuclear before closing down coal plants. Their emissions have flatlined. They haven't gone down as well in the last 10 years. That is a crime against humanity, I'm going to say, or at least the humanity of our children. So these are the kinds of difficult things we have to start dealing with in the energy space. We have some things going for us. Thanks to Germany again, with one hand brick back, the other hand applauded. They drove the reducing cost curve of solar by having a feed-in tariff, thanks to a Green Labour government at the beginning of the 2000s. And that led to dramatically large-scale purchasing of solar, and the primary driver of cost reductions in technology industries is production scale. They achieved production scale. And then the Chinese took it up. The largest commissioning of solar in history has been by the Chinese government which continues to invest more each year in renewable energy than in fossil fuel energy. And as a result, we all around the world are benefiting from very cheap solar, which continues to drop in price every year by between 15 and 20%, which is extraordinary. And we don't seem to see the vanishing point at this stage. There is very good chance that solar by the end of the 2030s will be virtually free, the cost of wallpaper. And some nice things, there'll be... There is already now solar which is coming out in thin film which you can put on the outside of all these stupid glass buildings we've built around the world. Stupid because they're very inefficient in terms of heat and so on. However, they'll be useful because we'll be able to cover them in solar cells everywhere and every city, including Hong Kong that has very little other services, will be able to cover itself with solar cells. That's where we're going on clean energy. In wind, prices keep dropping. I find it extraordinary. It seems like an old technology. But we've seen offshore wind in particular continue to drop in price by between 7 and 12%. So we're winning on energy slowly but surely. But of course, the scale up is still way too low. So whenever I meet someone who's a solar developer or a wind developer or a clean energy developer, I say, You are a hero for humanity. You may be doing it because it's a business, I don't care. All I know is that's what I need to have any future for my children. Think about that. We know what the other things are. We know we have to have mass transport. That is, away with the cars. Move to various forms of low carbon transport. Rail, electric rail, is a classic example of what we need to build around the world. We need to build it not just because we need to get people out of cars and out of trucks onto freight rail, but also we need to get people out of short haul aviation. We should not be flying jets between Momo and Stockholm. We need to be building high-speed rail in all of these places. 75% of the aviation emissions come from short-haul aviation. That is one-hour flights or thereabouts, because you're going up and you're coming down. If we could replace all short-haul aviation with low-carbon transport, that's a huge saving in emissions that we can do just right there. Of course, it requires massive capital expenditure, because you've got to build a lot of railways, productive infrastructure, I'm one of these people who commutes between Brussels and London on the high-speed rail. I can tell you it's a lot nicer than catching a plane. None of those really complicated queues at the airports. None of those, you know, waiting in a coffee shop 15 minutes, moving on to the next queue for 15 minutes and so on. And I think, so there, I think there are some utility things that we can sell as part of this transition. Of course, we may be able to do it with battery. It's possible. There is now a company selling... 20-seater uh, commuter aircraft using batteries is coming into service in 2022. So we do need to be technology agnostic in this. It may not necessarily be rail, even though that looks viable now. Whatever, it has to be low carbon. We know that green buildings will buy us time. By the time we've converted our energy system to 100% renewable, it won't matter if you leave the windows open in winter. You can just do that, as we do in Reykjavik already where the energy is geothermal. If the room gets too hot in the middle of winter, you just open the windows. It's the easiest thing to do. When you've got that much energy and it's low carbon, it doesn't matter. But in the intervening period, in the transition period, if we can dramatically improve the energy efficiency of our buildings, we reduce energy use in our larger European grid. We make it easier to shut down coal and gas sooner as we shift so that's why we're doing it. 
about 40% of the emission savings in the next 30 years that we're going to achieve will come from the built environment, electricity savings, that is. And that requires us to have very energy efficient buildings. That's why I say those glass walls are not particularly efficient, because they aren't thermally, unless you've got a very clever design behind you. But once you come from the solar cells, maybe we can get there. We know that water infrastructure is a critical part of it, not just hydro. 7% of the world's electricity goes to pumps shifting water around the planet. In some places, like California, 17% of the state's electricity is used just to shift water around, slosh it around between dams and difficult to get to places and the cities. If we make that much more energy efficient, again, ideally move to gravity like the Romans used, we save a lot of power. And we also have an adaptation agenda. Because in many parts of the world, in virtually all parts of the world, water is going to become a more volatile resource. It will be full one year and gone the next year. So we're going to need a lot more storage, especially in places like the Sahel, in India, in China. That's water infrastructure. If we're clever about it, we can make it pumped hydro, like all those Norwegian dams. That is, you build water on two levels. When the wind's blowing at night, you pump it up, and then you use it as a battery during the day. We're going to need this to balance renewable energy. So when people tell you you can't use renewable energy in an integrated system, just say pump hydro. 98% of all battery usage in the world is pumped hydro. We have a huge water infrastructure program that's required around the world. We just got to build the right way. We know that adaptation is going to be a major agenda for us. We already have sea level rise of about a metre. We're going to see the next metre happen very, very quickly. 30 years max, according to the IPCC. I actually think we'll see the next meter in the next 15 years on the basis of what we're seeing as thermal expansion of the oceans. So let's get used to it. Singapore is raising its ports by two meters to cope with increased sea level and storm surge activity that comes with much more intense cyclones and hurricanes and storms that we're going to get in the next few years. Every port around the world has to do that. That's an adaptation investor. That can be used for things like green bonds. And there are many other adaptation investments, starting with water, but in hardening infrastructure of all sorts. And then we have to look at adaptation investments that can support economic development in the most vulnerable countries, who will need to dramatically improve their livelihoods so they can cope with the kind of weather shocks they're going to have. Otherwise, they'll be coming across the Mediterranean every year. So that, that's what gives you about 90 trillion. There's actually hundreds of activities that are relevant. I'm a member of the European Union's technical expert group at the moment designing a taxonomy for sustainable finance, which are essentially investments relevant to addressing the Paris Climate Change Agreement that will be part of a regulated market of sustainable investments in Europe in the next few years. It's going to stretch to 40 pages or so of kind of the procurement list for the future. Let's call it that. We know we have the capital. And you know, this is the thing that gives me hope. Because, you know, I mean, in a way, think about how lucky we are. We have about $100 trillion invested by institutional investors around the world, globally, at about $100 trillion, US dollars. It's an extraordinary amount of money. The US economy is $17 trillion. The Swedish economy is about three quarters of a trillion. So you've got a vast capital pool. In Europe, 21% of institutional investment capital is invested in zero interest rate bonds, like the German Bunds. These are very bad investments to pay pension funds. You get no return whatsoever. That money needs to go into somewhere productive investments. One of the places you get productive investments is long-term infrastructure, especially productive investments that suits the safety needs of pension funds and insurance funds. So we're incredibly lucky. At this stage, on this side of the stage, we have a species-defying threat. We're looking at possibly losing a third to two-thirds of the world's population over here, this century. We know that we've got to invest $90 trillion. So, and we kind of know what to invest it in. And then on this side, we've got about $100 trillion of capital. And the inflows into that sector are vast each year. That pot keeps growing each year because we have been very good, especially in Western economies, of creating capital accumulation vehicles in the forms of pension funds and insurance funds. So we keep a massive more capital. And it hasn't got a place to go. How lucky are we? All we have to do is build a, 
an aqueduct between this side and that side. And that's the role of the finance sector and the banking industry and cities. Because 80% of what we have to do is about cities. It's not about forests. Don't get me wrong. The emissions challenge of avoiding deforestation is huge. But the bulk of where the money has to go in the next 30 years is urban development. We currently have about 55% of people living in cities. We're going to have about 80% by 2050. Partly because of natural movement and partly because what happens in increased weather volatility, famines, droughts, floods, is that people move into the cities after every incident and they don't go back. So we have to invest in low carbon and economically productive cities that can soak up vast masses of people. So our urban, our transition development to address climate change is urban, urban, urban. Clean, green and productive that can create jobs for people. So we have the money, we have the solutions. The green bond market is a kind of response to that. If you like, it's proof of concept. If we create green bonds, as Melbourne has done, we'll hear a little bit of that in a minute, we know now that investors will buy them. In fact, what we find is much higher levels of oversubscription in the green bond market than in normal bonds. That is, the demand for green is stronger than the demand for ordinary bonds. Because investors, like pension funds and insurance funds, are full of actuaries who are looking at future risk. They understand they have a major problem matching assets and liabilities over 30 to 40 years. The initial leaders of this market were the Swedish AP funds, AP1 to AP4, who have been important investors in green bond and been pushing companies around the world to shift to a green pathway. Your pension funds. So we have a good start, but it is only about 440 billion outstanding. US, this is 160 billion last year, it'll be 200 billion or so this year. It is a variety of issues. It's banks, it's corporates, it's sovereigns like France and Belgium, as well as cities around the world. But most of the activities that are being invested in relate to urban infrastructure. It's green buildings, it's railway lines, it's water infrastructure. These are the things that people are investing in. Oversubscription, as I said, is normal. Upsizing is normal. People come to market, they get such strong demand, they tend to increase their ambition for the bond. So what I'm really saying is we have strong proof that this <coughs> instrument works, that investors will respond if stuff is created. As I said, it's more than clean energy. It's buildings, transport, water, and various other things. It's not to say that we need to label bonds green. There are many bonds out there that are clearly relevant to the climate already, such as Eurofema or Deutsche Bahn. They're not labelled green. But what we found is investors really like the visibility associated with, with identifying something as green or climate related. That then gives them a story to take back to their stakeholders. BlackRock tells me, stop calling things climate aligned, just get everyone doing green properly. So green is a marketing theme. It's like a fair trade coffee label. There are some rules associated with it. There are initially green bond principles and current bonds initiative rules about what is a green bond. The transparency you have to and your reporting to make sure you're doing it the right kind of way. This has now become codified in regulation. So the Chinese have brought in, first of all, regulated definitions and very strong financial sector regulator rules about what can be a green bond, how banks have to do it. That's now been copied in Europe, where we have the European Commission bringing in green bond standard and regulations to make sure that the market stays true to its objectives and protect consumers. We have a whole bunch of topics coming in. This is basically what's going to be in the European taxonomy. In other words, it's industry, it's waste, it's ICT, that is technology, as well as buildings, transport and clean energy. A wide range of areas are relevant to the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. There's a report, I've got copies here if you want, looking at that. To finish up, we haven't even begun to shift our economy to the extent that we need to shift. We are making good progress in some places, only a few scattered around the planet. Malmo is one of those places. We'd like to see more progress in Malmo, but you know, it is a global leader. The more you do things in cities, 
which are about low carbon and climate resilience. The more we learn how to do them around the world, the mission for cities that are beginning to do this is to export, is to partner, is to work with cities around the world. When I'm working in Lagos or in Indonesia, there's an incredible lack of knowledge about what to do. They need services, they need support, they need advice, they need learning from the leaders. Our mission, as people that have the extraordinary privilege of wealth, is to get it right in our own backyard and take that story and share that with the rest of the world as fast as possible. You in the cities you're coming from should not only be developing solutions which can allow a future to be created for your kids, but to go on a crazy export drive, whether that be a policy export or a partnership of another city or a commercial export, and take those ideas around the world and build a global green investment pipeline which is commensurate the challenge the International Panel on Climate Change has given us. We know we've got to look at more creative financing models in cities. The one I'm most interested in is value capture models. In Hong Kong, they've taken the idea that was used in Copenhagen and they've made it big. Subways in Hong Kong are built by MTR. They, get, they buy the rights to build property over every station. They build huge developments over every subway station. They pay for the subway as a result, and they return a dividend to the Hong Kong government. In other words, they're a profit-making entity. In fact, they're listed on the stock exchange, 75% owned by the government, 25% owned by private investors. That's how we've got to build transport and cities in the future. So that's a model we can push around the world. We need to have clever government incentives. We have fiscal constraints in all governments around the world. But yet we have a, a huge toolkit of things that we've done to build infrastructure before. A bit of guarantee here, a bit of regulatory setting here which kills the bad investments like incandescent light bulbs and makes sure that only LED light bulbs survive in the marketplace. These are fiscally efficient measures that governments can take to drive investments in the right place. Licensing electric vehicles and de-licensing fossil fuel vehicles, for example. We know, need to understand it's not just about the environment. In emerging markets, it's about jobs. It's about liberal cities. In India, Delhi has the worst air of any big city in the world. Average life expectancy is nine years less than it should be if they clean up their air. That is about capturing biomass being burned off out the side of the city, which can be used for waste to energy, and getting rid of fossil fuel cars. Simple. <coughs> it's a climate change agenda. That's a more livable city. And we need to get investors to start asking, why not green? In Sweden, I had an incredibly exciting conversation about three months ago in Stockholm, where in, a major investor said to me, oh, in Sweden now, if someone issues a bond and it's not green, the first question we ask them is, why isn't it green? Is there something we should know? Is there something you're not doing right? That's exactly what we've got to get to around the world. With major companies, we need to say, what's your green transition strategy to a low carbon economy? If you haven't got one, is there something wrong? Have you missed something? Is there something that we need to know about because your shares might tank in the next couple of years? This is a question that we need to be asking everyone. And it's especially an important question for investors. Investors, we say, need to become aggressive partners with cities in developing the kind of world we want to live in. We have a short moment in history here. We have, as the IPCC says, maximum 12 years. Christiana Figueroa says five years. A short moment in history to change our economic direction. I'm not going to suggest no growth. That's a much more complicated story. I'm not going to suggest that it's some parts of the world because no one is good enough. What I am going to suggest is that if we do invest in the way we need to invest, we will create 30 years of economic growth. We'll create 30 years of job creation. We'll create 30 years of wealth creation. We can have a longer discussion about what that means to the kind of world we live in while we're addressing the environment. We have an extraordinary privilege in this room. That is, we can see what needs to be done. We have the relative wealth to be able to act. And we have access to tools like green bonds or other sorts of instruments to use. The 100 and 
50 million people living in the delta of Bangladesh do not have that privilege. The people living in the deltas of the Mekong do not have that privilege. They will be forced to move or die. We can do something. So we must. Thank you.